All right. Yeah, we got to get trucking. We only got 50 minutes left. We have to get cooking here. Um, okay. So we talked about MVC. PHP didn't have it. It has it today, but at the time it didn't have it. So we introduced, uh, they came out with a new language called Ruby. Um, Ruby solved two problems here. So Ruby included its own web server. So this allowed developers to get up and running right off the bat rather than having to rely on an IT person to get their server set up and configuring and things like that. Um, it also included its own template engine. All right, so you know you could effectively, so we really were saying it supported MVC natively, it natively supported MVC. Um, so when you download uh, Ruby on Rails, so you've heard you've heard that phrase Ruby on Rails. Yeah. Rails is actually a web server. So instead of Apache, you Apache. yeah yeah you you use that. And then there's a Ruby plugin for Apache that allows you to run it on Apache if you want. But bottom line is is that as from a developer's perspective, you can start writing and testing your code in Ruby instantaneously. You don't have to. There's no delay waiting for somebody to get a server up and running, and then you having to like upload stuff from here to there and then test it in the web browser here and it made development, the development life cycle a lot quicker. All right, so then what's the problem with Ruby? So we fixed two problems that uh, Pi, that uh, PHP had rather, um, but now this introduced a new problem. A new problem was is you had to, um, um, had to do things the Ruby way, which isn't necessarily a problem. But since it was a completely integrated system, you had to learn the Ruby system for doing things. And whether you liked their template engine or not, you had to use their template engine. All right. Uh, Ruby is still very popular today. Um, in fact, one problem that a lot of people have with Ruby is actually the same um, issue uh, that a lot of people like Ruby for. Uh, Ruby does a lot of the magic for you. It makes things just kind of work. And sometimes it's a little bit magical how stuff works to the point where until you've done it enough times and you believe that if you do this, then this happens, it's hard for you to see what's actually happening in the middle because Ruby is doing so much of the work for you. So from that perspective, it's a really cool rapid application development tool. But at the same time, if you're trying to, I don't think it's a very good tool to learn programming because it's hiding a lot from you. Kind of makes sense? But it's good. It's still popular today. All right. So that's, uh, that's Ruby. Sure, go ahead. We're talking, language. We're talking about the language, yeah. Not so much client side because these are so far all server side. Huh? These are all server side languages. The only client side language all would be server JavaScript. Server side. Yeah. All that server side. Language. Yep. Uh, it's not for general purpose. They're still general purpose. They just happen to be uh, geared for web. Yeah. So far, so far, all of these are interpreted languages. So these are all. Uh, high level, interpreted, general purpose programming languages. That's what we're dealing with here so far. And you'll find that web languages tend to be that. They're still general purpose. They just have some tools built into them to make them web friendly. So they're not... They don't, they're not lacking stuff from a general purpose language. They just have some extra stuff that allows you to do kind of common web things conveniently. <clears throat> so after Ruby, and you know, some of these things were maybe, um, you know, some of these things kind of came out at similar times, but let's just get the list out. We had a language called Python. All right, uh, and really it was probably uh, Google 
that made Python popular. So internally, Google used Python for quite a bit of their, uh, their stuff. Um, so what did Python give us? Python gave us a lot of the benefits of, um, uh, of Ruby. So Python had something built into it. called pip. Okay, so this was a package manager built into Python. So pip is a package manager that allowed you to install a bunch of third party stuff like template managers, etc to give it MVC support and things like that. So it didn't solve all the problems for you. Instead, it gave you a tool that allowed third party places to create. You had the choice of seven different template engines to use for your uh, Python based web applications rather than having to do it the Ruby way, only the Ruby way. Now, having said that, Ruby also had something called gems, which was a package manager for third party stuff, but did not allow for replacing core Ruby elements. So gems kind of introduced the idea of allowing you to bring other people's stuff into your project, but you were still stuck with the core Ruby infrastructure, which a lot of people like. Ruby's still popular today. Yeah, so we're not necessarily talking about dead languages. We're just kind of talking about Here's this language, it maybe wasn't as flexible as something else, and it was kind of the motivation for why this other language came out. Uh, now, at the same time, and kind of along the lines of what you were saying, um, <coughs> Python, we could probably say is more general purpose. That is, it really wasn't written specifically for doing web stuff. If you wanted to do web stuff with Python, you would use some of the pip packages that allowed it to do more webby things. The language itself was more of a general purpose uh, thing that you could apply to web stuff if you wanted to. Um, Python's also pretty important, uh, or pretty popular in uh, things like what's called data science, and uh, a, a field called big data. Um, so it's used heavily there. So Python's a very, very popular language, and that's kind of why I like to use it in here, okay? So more of a general purpose language, has all the third party stuff, blah, blah, blah. And then finally, how many of you have heard of something called Node.js? It's really the current cool kid. So Node.js, if we look at these other ones, if you're writing a Python web application, what you have is you have a front end that's HTML and JavaScript, and you have a back end that's Python, or you have a back end that's Ruby, or you have a back end that's PHP, or back end that's Perl, if you go back really far. Okay. So you have to you learn two different languages. Now the reality is, is that um, we kind of have created this hybrid type of position in, um, as a web developer. So a lot of times web developers uh, start off as designers. Okay, so they're kind of art people who've gotten pretty skilled at using tools and Photoshop and all sorts of things like this for designing websites that look pretty good, right? And they can even, then they started cross training and we're even able to do some JavaScript stuff. Now these folks wouldn't consider themselves professional programmers, but they would probably consider themselves pretty good designers and adequate programmers for web stuff. So you gotta consider if you're on a website, a lot of the programming on common websites is gonna be like reading in three or four things from a web form, passing it to the server, processing those things and storing it in a database. All right, you're, so you're really talking about a lot of, you know, 
uh, re repetition of kind of like common moves instead of solving, you know, writing some weird algorithm that solves some very unique problem. It's not really the go-to move for, uh, for web-based stuff. But a limitation that web programmers had is if they were comfortable with the graphics and they were comfortable with HTML and they were comfortable with JavaScript, you know, to an extent, getting them to then also go over and work on the PHP, the, you know, Perl, uh, the, uh, uh, Ruby, the Python side was, was a jump because they weren't necessarily programmers. So learning that one language was, was maybe a chore for them and it was intimidating for them to go and learn something else. So what Node.js did, so up to this point, let me actually pause this for a second. I'm going to throw something out here. So these are all server side web languages. That's what all those are. Now, JavaScript would be a client side web language, right? How many of you have heard of Ajax? What about jQuery? <coughs> or jQuery? So, what is Ajax and jQuery? Okay, so weakness with um, uh, web pages for a long time was let's say you were uh, trying to follow a uh, you know, sports scores. You had to keep hitting refresh on the page to get the, the, the updated score to load, right? So Ajax was a technology that allowed you to have hot spots on the page reload within themselves. Yep, yep. Uh, well, actually, it would be they, they asynchronously worked. So they kept themselves in sync with something on the uh, other side, but only part of the page would reload on its own rather than requiring the entire page to load. So that was an asynchronous action for that one part of the page to operate on its own. Um, and that, I mean, that part of it's kind of unimportant. But uh, uh, so Ajax let you do that. Uh, jQuery solved a pretty similar problem, just kind of did it a little bit better. Okay. Now, what's funny though is, is that if we go back to this slide here, everything that gets sent to a web browser is HTML and JavaScript. This is client side over here. Why do I have Ajax and jQuery sitting here underneath client side web? Yeah, but the browser only understands JavaScript. Yeah, so here's the deal. Ajax, jQuery, they've kind of taken on their personalities of their own, right? We kind of hear about them as buzzwords. The reality is, is they're both just JavaScript libraries. They're implemented in JavaScript. So some smart person wrote a library in JavaScript. They named it Ajax, and now people use it pretty often. So it's often used separately. We kind of talk about it like it's its own technology, but it's actually just a really cool JavaScript library. Same thing with jQuery. Make sense? So where Node.js comes in is it solves a couple of problems. The big problem it solves is the server side language is the same as the client side language. So Node.js is a server side technology. Where the language is JavaScript. 
So now if you are a web, you've been a web programmer for a while, maybe you mostly do client side stuff, because you're already familiar with JavaScript, you might be more comfortable going over to the server side if you're using the exact same programming language to write your server side stuff. Make sense? All right, so it gives you those two pieces. Now, Node.js also allows for asynchronous uh, events. So this kind of goes hand in hand with something we were running into over, uh, um, where am I at here? You heard of something called Angular? So Angular is another client side uh, web technology. Again, it's something built in JavaScript. Okay, something built in JavaScript. Here is it? Is it too small? Angular. Okay, uh, it's still built in JavaScript, but it kind of works hand in hand with Node.js. You don't have to use Node.js for this guy but they work really nicely together. With Ajax and jQuery, it's that front end that has to say, I'm gonna maybe every 15 seconds, I'm gonna check in with the server and see if the sports score have updated. So it's on this cadence where he has to keep checking in, checking in, checking in. With Angular, the information is pushed. So, Angular creates a event listener with Node.js. And then whenever something changes on the server, Node.js pushes that update to your website. Now what's really cool with this is if you do this in conjunction with a uh, supporting database, you can change something in the database manually behind the scenes. You can go into the database and change something and the website will instantaneously update. Is the database pushes to the server, which pushes to the website. You don't have to wait for the next time the website checks in. It gets pushed to the, to the website. This is Angular. Uh, it's Angular used in conjunction with Node.js. Dynamic website, uh, they have yeah. uh, choices to choose between uh, Ajax and Angular. Yeah, so the reality here is, is that Angular is really an updated version of these things. So it's still all about having parts of your web page be hotspots that can update on their own, um, but it can do some pretty cool stuff that uh, jQuery couldn't. That is, it can be updated. Uh, instead of it having to check for an update, the other side can tell it to update. Okay, so, but these are still all JavaScript. Right? So what it does is that this deals with event-driven stuff. So your, a, your Angular code uh, establishes a, um, uh, an event listener and just basically it kind of creates its own little server in your web page and waits for, your, waits for the web server to talk to your server to update the web page. So it's actually pretty interesting stuff. But in any case, you're talking about kind of the evolution of those languages. So this really kind of covers our... Uh, um, web side of languages, so we kind of see where we, how we got to where we are today. But notice here that pretty early on, we had PHP, and that's still a popular language today. But PHP stayed in existence because of the infrastructure that was built around web development. Because we have web hosting places like GoDaddy that will allow you to bring up a PHP-supported uh, web server instantaneously. Right, you know, you have all sorts of tools out there now that allow you to do web development without having to know about installing web servers and configuring them for the PHP module and all this stuff. PHP also, because it's been pretty popular, has a whole bunch of third-party uh, mm -hmm. template engines that you can use with it. Uh, some popular ones are like Jade um, that you can use uh, with PHP to encourage MVC. So. Old school PHP, you had your HTML and you had your PHP in the same file. Now what you'd have modern PHP, you would have at the top of your PHP file, you would include a certain script. So you would load it in there, but or include a certain template. So you'd have one line inside of your PHP file that brought your template in, but you would actually do all of your visual design 
over in the template side of things, hence implementing MVC. Okay, but because so because the technology was popular and infrastructure was built around it, that still makes it relevant today. Um, Ruby is pretty popular because <coughs> of when it came out. When it came out, that infrastructure was not built around PHP. So people jump ship to Ruby and a lot of sites were created um, uh, very quickly and pretty powerfully using Ruby on Rails. Um, uh, I think uh, Twitter was originally written in Ruby uh, as an example. You know, and that has, why do I have Ruby on there twice? Really important. All right, so really, Ruby's success is because of its timing. Make sense? Um, because at the kind of at the same time, another technology came out that you may have heard of called Cold Fusion. It's kind of a popular web technology that was out, very proprietary. So let's call it a kind of a competitor with Ruby. Ruby won that war. Nobody uses Cold Fusion anymore, but Ruby is still commonly used because it's there was a lot of people that did a lot of rapid application development stuff with it. So you can bring up websites in Ruby pretty quickly. Uh, in fact, a lot of those programming boot camps that exist out there today, they're training you to be Ruby developers so that you know they guarantee you get a job when you get out of there or something like that. Uh, because getting up to speed and doing some cool stuff with Ruby is pretty fast, even if a lot of the magic is hidden from you. Okay, so if you're goal-oriented as opposed to um, wanting to learn all the details, Ruby can be a pretty good tool. Uh, and something we're going to look at for our homework is going to be kind of similar uh, to that. We'll talk about that here in a little bit, but uh, um, uh, it allows you to generate applications very quickly. All right, so uh, in any case, that's kind of our, uh, our web side of things. All right, questions about that? Uh, now, one thing I'll throw out there in terms of like exams and stuff like that, um, I you know some of these questions are going to be fair game for exams, but uh, a majority of the exams are going to be programming questions. All right, so um, this is more background information to kind of uh, fill in the gaps for what you know versus what you don't know. All right, I'm not going to ask you to regurgitate a lot of the stuff. I'm, you know, you're not going to have to memorize Perl versus PHP versus Ruby, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, I could ask a question about MVC or something like that, but most of it will be um, uh, programming stuff. And I'll be clear about what kind of questions to be prepared for when we get there. But, you know, kind of keep in mind that this is a lot of supporting material versus stuff that I want you to memorize. Hopefully you find it pretty interesting in terms of the kind of the history of this stuff and where we got to where we are today. Um, and I find it interesting, and I think it's important that you kind of have an understanding of this stuff, but if you, you know, don't have it memorized, that's not the end of the world. But it kind of tells us where on the map we are in the, in the history of programming. Ask about who? What's this? Python? Well, maybe. Your assignment for next week is not on Python. Yeah, your, your, your exam will be related to what we do this week for next week, as well as Python stuff. You're going to see in the first four weeks, we're probably going to do more of the stuff that we're going to do for this first homework assignment. We're going to be using this platform called Mendix, which is a low-code co low application development platform. So it's going to be more about programming problem solving and less about syntax. The second four weeks will focus more on the syntax of Python after you kind of have some of those programming skills under your belt. Kind of that idea of I said that the you know, what makes programming difficult for people is that we're so diff we're so good at solving problems we have trouble articulating it. One of the uh, problems with teaching programming, especially in an accelerated uh, course like this, is we don't have time to make all the mistakes. So what I'm using is instead of having you um, for the first four weeks, let's say rather than you having to fight with the syntax of Python as well as learning how to program. Those are two separate things, right? Um, we're going to focus on the learning how to program side of things using this tool called Mendix so that you're not having to write syntax that's like, you know, you're going to have to learn how to use the tool and that's what you'll be doing for your first homework assignment. 
but it's all drag and droppy and, and stuff like that. You know, it's kind of like learning to use Microsoft Word, you know, that type of type of thing. So then we'll get comfortable with kind of solving, you know, programming types of problems. And then once we're kind of comfortable with that, then we'll throw the Python syntax at you, um, which will be intimidating, but at least you won't be having to learn both of them at the same exact time. Make sense? So your midterm is probably going to be more focused on the Mendix stuff. And then maybe a little bit on Python, depending on kind of when we get started with that. The final will be more focused on the Python. Okay. Um, yeah. So in any case, so this is the web stuff. I'm just going to kind of scoot this over to the side. And then we're going to get over here to the... Actually, let's... Um, label some of these things. So C is uh, from somewhere in the around 19, 1968-ish ballparky. Okay, so C is around then and it's a procedural <coughs> language. All right. Um, so we want to talk about the pros and cons of C. So C programming language, it supported something, I'm just going to kind of get a checklist of things that supported it. It supported something called a struct. Okay. Um, before that, it also supported arrays. So arrays, this is a collection of like type values. So array, so, so it's supported those. It supported variables. So variables, arrays, these are name value pairs. Structs, this is a collection of values that are not necessarily of the same type. All right, so this would kind of be the high level version. This is a procedural language, which means it's like the telephone with all the wires exposed. Okay, so you saw all the details in C. All right, so for a long time, C was good enough. You know, consider in the you know early 70s, the complexity of the programs we were writing was far less complex than the programs we're writing today, right? Fair enough, fair enough assumption. All right, so with that in mind, um, uh, C held its own for a long, long, long time. Kind of similar to how we would say that the early days of, Pi, uh, of PHP, the fact that it didn't support MVC wasn't that big of a deal. You know, the websites we were creating with PHP were pretty simple, so who cares? We'll just mix our PHP and our HTML code together, and it's not the end of the world. But as the types of problems we started trying to solve, as our computers got faster and, you know, human ingenuity kicked in and said, oh, well, you know, we thought computers can only do X, Y, and Z. Now let's try to do A, B, and C with them. We started pushing the C language a little bit farther and a little bit farther and a little bit farther until we started seeing some weaknesses. And the real weakness uh, kind of hinges around this idea of a struct. So let me show you kind of what structs are. So in C, we might create a struct. <laughs> and inside here we might have a um, uh, a string first name, a string last name, and maybe an int h. So three pieces of information that we want to store. So this is a collection of stuff um, that maybe leads to a person. So this is a struct or something called a person. All right, so we're remembering a first name, a last name, and maybe that person's age, something like that. Um, <clears throat> this is helpful. So when we talk about arrays, collection of elements, they all have to be the same. 
and we'll get into that in more detail when we start talking about arrays. This is just kind of talking about the high level here. So you could hold like a whole bunch of numbers or a whole bunch of strings or a whole bunch of characters, things like that using uh, arrays. Structs allow us to be a little bit more specific. We can say, I want to hold two strings and an integer. And you can even give the two strings individual names and the integer an individual name. Great. It's all fine and dandy. But we do have a limitation here where these guys can't do things to each other. Or, or, or to themselves, rather. So if we go back to our mapping slide, we talked about that memory is implemented through the idea of variables. So that's storing name value pairs. So like first name, last name, age, those are variables. Great. Asking questions, that's a logic thing. Repetition through functions. So we really want to think about what is a function. So a function is a reusable chunk of code that we write once and call multiple times. Okay, so for example, um, all of us inside of our head have the ability to, retrieve, to, to add two numbers together, right? So if I say three and one, you would say four. Okay, five and three, you would say eight, so on and so forth. So you have this ability in your head, you have a function inside your head that you know if you are given two pieces of information, you can add them together and spit out the result, right? But that function is written generically inside your head. You have it memorized that three plus one is four, or maybe that one you have. But you haven't memorized the sum of every, of two, of every number, every two numbers, correct? I can give you any two numbers and you can add them together unless they were so, so huge that it was intimidating, but any two reasonable size numbers, and you could add them together. And that's not something you're doing out of memorization, it's because you've learned how to add. So I can give you any two inputs, and you can apply that function that you have there to those two inputs and produce a correct output. That makes sense? So that's what a function is. Now, um, the advantage of functions is we can write them one time, and, have, and implement them in terms of generic logic. And then we can call them over and over again. So you know, how to you know how to add two numbers. So you've implemented it generically. I can hand you any two numbers, you can add them together. It would be nice if we can do that in our programming languages. Now, a language like C does support that. So our older programming languages support that. What they didn't support that started becoming a problem is we could not embed functions inside of structs. So structs in and of themselves um, could only hold information. They can only remember things in a somewhat organized fashion. You know, we can say that, okay, a person has a first name. Maybe my first name is Mike. My last name is Lippman. My age is 17. Yeah. I mean, I'm almost old enough to drink. 70. <laughs> um, I'm balding. I got the big bald spot in the back here, too. It's, oh, it's... I, can, I can believe 70. More than 17. Well, me? Yeah, yeah. I am older than 17. Yeah, yeah, but we're going with that here. So I'm, well, eight, no, 21. We should be 21. No. I can. Yeah, I'm 21. I was good, like... All right, so I'm going to be 21. All right, so. Um, so it's nice with structs that we can have these name value pairs with some, with some meaning, right? Cause before structs, let's say we were, uh, had an array that we wanted to hold this piece of information and we would have to remember that bucket zero of the array is holding the person's first name. Bucket one is holding the person's last name. Bucket two is holding the string representation of their age, something like that. You know, it, it becomes kind of unclear for us where a struct allows us to give meaning to the values that we're holding. But where it comes up short is we can't have functions associated with it. So for instance, if I want to have a, um, a function that will tell you how old I will be in five years, okay, or how old I will be in some number of years, all right? So 
that a function would take in one parameter a number of years and the, you would add that to your current age and spit out the result, okay? So in five years, I would be 26, right? Something like that because I'm, I've added five to whatever my current age is. A language like C doesn't allow us to embed functions like that inside of structs. So in order to have a function like that, we would have to have the function live separate. So maybe we have a function uh, that returns an int called add five, and this guy would take in a person p and a int num of years. And it would return p.age plus num of years. So you'd have to provide it both the person as well as the number of years in order for it to do it. So the real life example of this would be this. I know my age, right? But if I'm the struct version, I'm not, I don't have the ability to add five years to my age. So instead, what I have to do is I have to walk over to him. And I have to say, here, he's the function. He's this add five function. So I'm gonna hand him the information about myself, including my age. So I'm gonna add him person, okay, the struct associated with me, as well as the number of years I want him to add to my age. And he'll then spit back out, okay, this is how old you'll be in five years or something like that. Make sense? When that's something I should have been able to do myself. I know my age. You can give me a number and I can add five, you know, I can add that number to it. No, no problem. But we had a weakness here. The language didn't support it. Okay, so we needed an upgrade to this. So this was really kind of the advent of object-oriented languages. So this guy object-oriented programming. All right, so what this guy let us do <coughs> is it let us take this struct. Instead of calling it a struct, we call it a class. So this is a class called person. And then we can embed this function into that guy. But this function no longer needs to take in a person because it knows about itself. So I'll return my age plus however many years you passed in. So now I'm able, now I'm more like that telephone that looks like a telephone. I'm self-contained. I have abilities as well as knowledge of pieces of information about myself. Make some sense? So I'm able to report to you how old I will be after so many years because I already know about my age and you hand me the number of years and I'm allowed to have functions. I can, I can do things besides just remember individual pieces of information. All right, so C++ brought that to the table. So C++ introduced classes. Uh, let's actually, I'm going to steal the C slide. We'll update this for C++. So this guy is a object-oriented programming language. Still has variables, still has arrays, still has structs, introduced this idea of a class, which is effectively a struct with embedded functions. So life is better. Okay, so the interesting thing here is that really the difference between a procedural language and an object-oriented language is a shoebox, a container to put some extra stuff in. 
It's just organization. We do the same thing at home, rather, right? So rather than just shove a whole bunch of individual things under our bed, we might put a couple of containers under our bed and separate stuff into the different containers for organization. So what C++ brought to the table is that, hey, here's a new box. If you'd like to put the stuff that used to live in a struct as well as that used to have lived outside the struct, both inside this box, they can play together nicer. Does that make sense? So the difference between an object-oriented language and a procedural language is just organization. No more difficult than that. But now what's the problem with C++? Problem with C++ is this guy empowered the programmer to make bad decisions. Okay, empowered the programmer to make bad decisions. What does that mean? Uh, we mentioned earlier that programming is hard, right? So uh, when you first start programming, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. That's another reason why we're going to use the Mendix thing initially, because you are less prone to make mistakes if you're not in control of a lot of the coding. You're just having to think about the problem solving. So it does a lot of the stuff for you initially. So most programmers, when they first start, are very error prone. They write a lot of stuff. And what you end up running into, and this is kind of a, a problem with beginning programmers, is they tend to take the trial and error approach. So one rule of thumb I would say is never write a line of code unless you have thought through why you're writing it. Never write a line just because the worst thing to do would be write something, try it, it doesn't work, and then you just randomly change stuff and then see if it works having no reason to believe it might work this time around, All right? Um, a lot of programmers do it that way because they're result-driven. We talked earlier about the Ruby on Rails people are more result-driven. They can produce websites very, very quickly, but they don't necessarily know what's actually happening under the hood. So they lose all these skills like debugging skills and fixing stuff. The problem-solving skills aren't really there. What ends up happening is, is you might think that you have a program that works and you're this really great programmer when all you did is you tried every permutation of, uh, uh, of solution until it finally spit out the result you wanted. And you have no idea why it actually currently works. It just happened to finally work. And that's not the way to program. You might get one right solution, but you're not actually learning stuff. So since beginning programmers are fairly error prone, a language like C++ is fairly dangerous because you might get some seemingly correct outputs done in some very, very inefficient ways. And a good way of looking at this would be uh, this. So let's say that, um, uh, let's, say, let's say you're having a party. You're gonna invite, you're gonna invite me to the next one, right? You're, go, you're not gonna invite me to the next party? No, not tonight, we're tired. Soon, so because okay, so you're gonna have a party, okay, and he's gonna invite his uh, his new buddy over to this party. All right, so now, do you give me the address to your house, or do you hand me your house and tell me to open the door at eight? Which of those two makes sense? No, I'm talking to you. Oh. <laughs> you still you awake? <laughs> Which do you do? Do you tell me where I can go and find your house, or do you hand me your house and tell me to, to open the door at 8? Uh, you tell you hand me where you're How strong are you? You can't lift a house, right? <laughs> no. Does it ever make sense to hand somebody the house? No. 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 You give them the address. You say, look, the party's at 8. Come to my house. Here's the address. Go and find it, right? A language like C++ would allow the programmer to decide to hand somebody the house. You could say, here's the house, open the door at eight. As long as you had enough system memory, that, could, that, that program could work. Does that make sense? Yeah. But we would say that it, that would never make sense in real life. It would never make sense to do that, correct? All right, so, C++ empowers the user to make bad decisions. So what came after C++? What 
in a language called Java. So if I take this slide, Java is object-oriented, has variables, has arrays. It got rid of structs, kind of erroneously so. Still has classes, and what this guy does is it makes a lot of the decisions for the programmer. So it kind of protects the programmer from themselves. The programmer still has to write all the logic. But since we decided it would never make sense to hand somebody the house, if you are handing an object, if you're passing an object uh, to somebody, you're inviting me to the party, so here's, here's the object, what you would hand me is where I can find your house, not the house itself. And Java only allows you to give me the house that way because that's the only way that would make sense. Make sense? So Java's making a lot of those decisions for you. Now, I'll kind of set us up here for next time, at least. So take Java. The next language here is C Sharp, right? And then I'm also going to hang a language over here called Objective-C. Okay, so this is a Macintosh, this is an Apple-based language. So next time we're going to talk about C-sharp compared to Java. So let's do a couple of slide setups here. C-sharp versus Java. And Objective-C. So we're going to talk about those two storylines. All right. So now for next week, and I'll put this assignment up, we're going to be using this tool called Mendix. So this guy is it's a, it's a low code programming platform. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to uh, um, create mobile applications as well as web-based applications, all using a single tool with very minimum programming. Now, what I'm going to have you do for next week is I'm going to have you go through kind of one of the uh, the core tutorials for this. And it's not really just a tutorial. It's kind of a, a learning pathway. In fact, at the end, there's a test you can take to get certified um, for this. So I'll also have you take the, uh, the test to do it. Um, it will probably take somewhere between five and seven hours total. And you could do it in pieces. So it's like kind of, here's the tool. You watch a video, you do what they tell you to do in the video, you watch another video, you do what they tell you to do in the other video. In the end, you will have produced something, but more importantly, what you will have done is you will have learned to use the Mendix platform. Now, the Mendix platform exists in two, two different versions. There's a web-based version of it, and there's also a desktop version of it. Both of them technically work, but you should definitely use the desktop version of it, which means that you have to do this on Windows. All right, so uh, uh, because the desktop version is not available for Mac. The web version is, um, I mean, you can try it if you're a Mac user, um, but it's in beta and you might have more bugs associated with it. So I would strongly encourage you to do it on the desktop side of things. Um, so what I'll be doing is I'll be giving you a link where to go. So it's under community developers. And there's a, a learning path in here. So I've got to learn, learning paths. What supposed to use the computer? Huh? Can we use the computer? Sure. Okay. Yeah, any Windows machine, you can do it. Yeah, so this is going to be the guy. This become a rapid developer guy right here. It lists it as three hours. You know, that this guy takes a total of three hours. Um, but if you're really reading everything and watching the videos, it's probably more like five or six or something like that. So plan your time accordingly. So I'm going to steal this guy here. So this will be the getting started thing. So your homework assignment will be to go through uh, this entire tutorial, produce something, and take the test at the end. Okay. I'd like you all to pass the test, but I'm not going to grade you on whether or not you pass the test. Because uh, you only get one shot at it. 
right? So if you happen to fail the test, then uh, not great stuff. Um, but the hope is, is that by the, I mean, you're really getting two things out of this. On one hand, you're all, you're getting the, uh, uh, the experience of using their tool um, so that that's what we're going to use the first four weeks of this class. On the other hand, assuming you do pass the test, so do take that test seriously, that gives you a certification that you can now put on your resume that you're a certified Mendix developer. And this, this guy is being coming quickly, uh, uh, it's being adopted by a lot of businesses. So you can read all about it, but this is kind of a big deal. So take your time, go through the tutorial, take the test seriously so that you can get certified and put it up on your, uh, it doesn't cost you anything, it's free, blah, blah, blah. Just, you can claim you're a Mendix certified developer. Something like that. All right. Questions about anything? I apologize. Uh, I'll give you instructions for what I want you to submit. Yeah, I'll put it in the homework. So you'll have to do a couple of screenshots, but then also show me like your your final final product or something like that. You'll give me a link to it because it'll be you'll actually deploy it on Mendix and and I can, I'll be able to view it online. Make sense? That'll all make sense when you go through that tutorial. Okay. Um, so that's what we'll be do for next week. But just give yourself some time to sit down and do it. Maybe don't try to do it all in one fell swoop because you might get a little whatever. All right. I will see you guys next uh, week. I'm also going to put up uh, instructions for you getting on Slack. So we use a Slack message group here on, on, uh, in the department. And I use it quite a bit. So I'll also have you get on to Slack for the class. Mm -hmm.